question is the Honorable. The Honorable Rafael Trujillo, council member from the city of Rialto, California. Council member Trujillo was elected to the city of Rialto in 2016. Before this election, he served two years on the West Valley Water District Board of Directors. And during his tenure in the city, um, in the city council, the city has been managing a major cleanup from a percolate, um, percolate contamination in the city's uh, ground water and an increased demand for water from the new residential and commercial customers uh, that the city has been um, welcoming. Uh, Council Member Trujillo, it's also a recent graduate of the Wells Untap Fellowship Program. So we are uh, grateful that he is joining us today and we'll get us started and introduce um, our experts for today. Councilman. Thank you. I just want to just want to say bienvenidos a todos for our discussion on water. I wanted to also let you know that uh, a lot of my passion for public service started as uh, a child translator. I learned early on the importance of access and the importance of providing opportunities for your community. And for a long time, I, I, I served on uh, two terms on the water. Uh, water board, and then I served on, uh, I'm on my second term with the city council. Uh, when I got to the city council, we had two long-term uh, council members who were serving on the sub water subcommittee. So a lot of my interest in water kind of took kind of the back seat. And I did, I did have some type of voice on water issues, uh, but it wasn't until I uh, really got involved with the, uh, the well, uh, 2023 fellowship program where a lot of my interests actually came back and reinvigorated because a lot of the stories of the residents that I met throughout the state who had challenges with water, who had lack of opportunities, all those resonated with me and, and took me really back to why I even started uh, getting involved with public service. So I just wanted to thank Well for this opportunity uh, to be part of their fellowship. And if you want more information, you can always go to latinosforwater.org. Um, but I wanted to continue. I welcome to all the Naleo members and friends. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, for the Naleo and Well uh, for this conversation on water. I'll be facilitating this important and timely discussion uh, as you know, we, uh, we have two speakers with us today. Uh, we'll have some time for you to be able to ask some questions if you'd like to put them in the chat uh, throughout the program. will be some time uh, for that. Uh, but as you know, water is one of the most valuable resources uh, our communities have. It is essential for life and for producing almost everything we depend on. Yet many regions across the country continue to face water-related crisis uh, due to uh, frequent and extended dry weather patterns. Recently, six southwestern states negotiated an agreement to use less water as reservoirs keep uh, falling to lower levels. The speakers joining us today will update us with updates on how we are doing uh, with this critical resource and what we can expect in the years to come. We will also learn more about water conservation efforts from a city in Arizona so at this time, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, one of our first panelists. Uh, her name is Ms. Heather Cooley, Director of Research at the Pacific Institute. Ms. Cooley has been with the Pacific Institute as a research associate since 2004. Over the years, she has worked with colleagues on a range of issues from seawater desalinization and the water energy nexus to the impacts of sea level rise on the California coast. She co-directed the Water and Sustainability Program for several years. In her current role, uh, she oversees a research team and helps to define and advance the Institute's research agenda to achieve its strategic priorities. Also joining us is Ms. Natalie DeRock. She is a Senior Public Information Officer for Tucson Water. She's former Public Affairs Strategist for the U.S. Department of State, in her former foreign affairs role, she amplified global programming for research partnerships and business development and directed the prestigious Fulbright Academic Exchange Program in Southeast Asia. She was the recipient of a National Science Foundation Award for her unique approach to developing best practices 
in peer-to-peer -peer STEM education at the University of Arizona. She is a natural multicultural and multilingual communicator and is best known as a water diplomat. We appreciate them for taking the time to join us today to share their expertise with us. We'll hear first from Ms. Cooley, followed by Ms. DeRock. After their remarks, they will take questions from the audience. If you have any questions throughout the discussion, feel free to raise your hand or send questions via chat. Without further ado, I'd like to invite Ms. Cooley to share with us how we are doing with our water resources. Ms. Cooley. Thank you, Councilmember Trujillo. It's a, a pleasure to be here today. I, I really appreciate this opportunity to, to speak with everyone. Um, and if you're able to pull up my slides, that would be great. Um, I'll, before we jump into, I'll give a little bit of uh, background on the Pacific Institute. Uh, and that'll, that'll be my second slide. Thank you. Next, please. So I'll give a little bit of background on the Pacific Institute. Um, we are a nonprofit organization. Uh, we were founded in California in 1987 uh, and now have staff around the world. Uh, our mission is to create and advance solutions to the world's most pressing water challenges. Um, we also, a number of years ago, uh, announced an organizational goal uh, about to catalyze the transformation to water resilience. And so I'll talk a bit about water resilience really as the framing um, around our work. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Uh, next slide, please. Today, I'm gonna touch on sort of national and regional trends in water use. Um, I'll talk a bit about new strategies and approaches for enhancing water resilience, including uh, the need to rethink water demand, rethink water supply and rethink management. Um, and then I'll, I'll provide a California case study, again, really to exemplify some of the opportunities um, that we have available to us. Next slide, please. There's a widespread perception that as we grow, we use more water. Um, but the United States has experienced a dramatic decoupling between water use and growth over the last 40 years. Uh, this figure shows population in orange and it shows total water use uh, in blue through 2015, which is the most recent year for which national data are available. Um, as we can see in this figure, national water use, oh, uh, next, next slide, please. Uh, national water use peaked around 1980, um, and we used less water, but then declined thereafter, and we used less water in 2015 than in 1970, despite continued population and growth. The bars at the bottom, oh, back on that last slide, just for a second, the bars at the bottom show water use for each of the major sectors. And we see that all sectors have shown this trend, this declining use. Energy, which is shown in purple and represents the single largest use of water, has dramatically reduced water use due to a shift to recirculating cooling systems, renewable energy systems, and energy efficiency improvements. Um, agriculture, which is shown in green, uh, uses less water now due to more efficient irrigation techniques. And municipal and industrial water use, which is shown there in blue, used less water in 2015 than in 1960, despite an 80% increase in population. So real dramatic changes and improvements over that time. Next slide. Uh, and we see the same trend in major cities, uh, especially in the Western US. Um, the blue bars here show water use and the green line shows population. And again, this is total water use. This is not per capita use. Um, and what we can see, Phoenix used less water in 2020 than in the mid 1990s, despite a 30% increase in population. Next slide, please. Los Angeles has also seen this trend. Los Angeles used 13% less water in 2020 uh, than in 1970, or excuse me, than in, in the 70s, despite uh, a 45% increase in population. Next slide. And we also see this in Denver. Uh, Denver used less water in 2020. This is shown uh, on, the, on the blue line here uh, than in the early 1970s, despite a 70% increase in population. So this is a trend that we see in communities uh, across the US and we even see it at a national level. Next slide, please. What's causing this decoupling? Um, there are a number of reasons that have caused this trend. 
first, uh, businesses and homes are using more efficient devices, more efficient toilets and clothes washers and shower heads. That has dramatically reduced usage. Uh, more and more uh, households, businesses, communities are putting in climate appropriate plants. They're, especially in the West, the sort of de facto use was were lawns, which are very water intensive. Um, now more and more you're seeing communities embrace lower water use plants. Um, we've also seen denser dis developments with more shared outdoor space rather than sort of single family type, types of lots with large outdoor spaces. Um, and we've seen a shift towards a less water, to, uh, excuse me, a shift toward a less water intensive service economy. So all of these factors together have really helped uh, to drive that decoupling. Next slide, please. And this has really been great news. Um, it's helped to reduce vulnerability to drought. If communities had continued to grow uh, and their usage was higher, they would have been more vulnerable to limits on water and to water scarcity. Um, it has allowed for delayed or downsized water and wastewater infrastructure investments. There's been a significant cost savings. Um, it's supported greater affordability for essential water needs. Um, if we had had to build that infrastructure, those costs would have been passed on to ratepayers and, and created uh, and exacerbated some of the affordability concerns, frankly, that we're already uh, struggling with. Um, it's helped to reduce energy use and greenhouse gas emissions because as we use, use less water, there's less pumping, there's less treatment, there's less heating of water, um, and that can significantly reduce energy use. And it has helped to avoid extraction of water from rivers and aquifers and, and for coastal communities, the ocean. Um, and this too has provided an environmental benefit as well. Next slide. Um, but despite the progress that's been made, um, the pressures on water resources are intensifying. Uh, communities are facing aging infrastructure. Uh, they're, they're facing threats to water quality and an alphabet soup of new contaminants. Uh, we're seeing declining ecosystem health and changing weather patterns. Uh, with wet areas, areas getting wetter, dry areas getting drier, and all areas experiencing more extremes, more floods, more droughts. This will require fundamental changes in how we use and manage water and requires to build on some of the successes, frankly, that we've already achieved. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk now about some key approaches for enhancing water resilience. Um, and I use the term water resilience to refer to the ability of water systems to function so that nature and people, including those on the front line and disproportionately impacted, thrive under shock, stresses, and change, and, and thrive under those types of changes that I, that I described in that previous slide. There are really three key shifts needed to enhance water uh, resilience. We must rethink water demand, rethink supply, and rethink water management. And again, we're already seeing evidence of this and we have lots of opportunities to be building on, on what we've been doing. Next slide, please. First, I wanna to touch on rethinking demand. Um, in order to address the challenges that communities are facing, we must dramatically expand our efforts to reduce waste and inefficiency across all sectors and to rethink our economic priorities and choices. Uh, so that can mean in urban areas, replacing old wasteful appliances and fixtures uh, with newer models that are much more efficient. Uh, replacing water intensive grass with plants better suited to our climate. Uh, building those denser developments, which can dramatically cut outdoor use on a per person basis. Um, and fixing leaks in, in homes and in businesses, but also in water delivery systems. Uh, on the agriculture side, of course, agriculture is a major user of water, um, particularly in the Western US. Agriculture can and must also play a role. Um, things like installing more efficient irrigation system, moving away from flood irrigation, um, using less water intensive crops, and even, even uh, some forms of fouling. Next slide, please. Uh, in many places, we've overtaxed uh, our rivers uh, and our underground aquifers and must now look to viable alternatives, uh, including things like recycling and reusing water, uh, capturing urban runoff, 
um, even in some instances, uh, desalination of brackish water. I wanna highlight that um, these types of supply projects can be done across scales. Um, the building on the far right there, that shows a high rise residential building in San Francisco that uses gray water and rainwater uh, for toilet flushing and for irrigation. So they're recycling and reusing water, uh, they're using stormwater, but they're doing it at a site level. Um, there are also, of course, opportunities to do this at a larger scale. I show on the bottom there a picture of a groundwater replenishment program where they're taking recycled water, recharging groundwater, and then reusing that water uh, for, for drinking water and other needs. Next slide. A key component is to rethink management as well. It's shifting from the sort of siloed approach where water and wastewater and stormwater and even land use are managed separately uh, and bringing them together in a more integrated approach. Um, it's expanding our definition of infrastructure to include not only pumps and pipes and aqueducts, but also our natural systems like our upland forest and our downstream wetlands. Um, and it's about embracing new technologies to, to, to uh, get better data, to use that data to inform our decision making in, in more real time. Ms. Ms. Cooley, yes. what, what, what kind of technologies uh, are out there for our communities to, to do something like that? For the, for the data and information? Yes. Specific? Yeah, so um, there are many, and, and I show actually, this is a really interesting one uh, in the middle there. It's, a, it's really a picture of my phone. <laughs> um, and what I am able to do on that is to see my water use in real time. Uh, so I'm able to identify leaks. Uh, as one example, I'm able to look how much I'm using, compare that with what I want to be using, and take very immediate action if there's a problem. Um, there are also, at the more community scale, other types of advanced metering that can do sim you know, provide similar uh, information to customers, so they are able to adjust their usage. Um, there are also, though, things that utilities can be doing to pull in information um, from different parts of their system so that they can better manage and balance that system. Uh, next slide. So I want to just provide a case study for California, and I provide this because this is where we've done some recent work to understand what these opportunities are, but I also think it demonstrates what opportunities might be found in other areas. So next slide, please. Like many of the communities I talked about at the beginning, California too has made significant improvements in efficiency. It uses less water today for urban usage than it did in the 90s, despite significant population and economic growth. Um, but we can build on some of those successes. Um, we've identified using existing technologies and practices, the potential to reduce urban use by an additional 30 to 48%. Um, that's replacing old appliances and fixtures with new models, putting in more efficient landscapes, those types of measures. Um, we've also seen where we've made significant improvements in reuse, but we're still discharging about 75% of the wastewater that we generate. Um, more of that could be reused. In fact, we estimate we could triple current water reuse levels across the state. And stormwater, I think like many communities, uh, communities in California, uh, put in a lot of paved areas <laughs> as they grew. Uh, and where stormwater was really viewed as a, as a liability, we are now seeing communities start to recognize it's an asset uh, and try to find ways to slow it down, to infiltrate it, and to use it to meet their water needs. And so, again, despite some of the work that's already been done, we see significant opportunities to expand that. Next slide. Um, I have just two more okay. I'd like to relay, and then I'll, I'll hand it off. Um, I really want to just highlight uh, the, the cost issue because I know that's a key concern. How do we pay for all of this, uh, particularly when we're already struggling with current water rates? I want to really highlight that the strategies that I've talked about, the efficiency uh, in particular, is highly cost effective. Um, this is some work we've done looking at the cost of various strategies on a dollar per acre foot basis. Uh, what we find is that water efficiency is the least expensive water supply option. In fact, it often saves customer money because of lower energy use that it provides. Um, stormwater capture can also be very cost effective uh, and followed by brackish and 
uh, desalination and, and recycled water, but all of these being much more cost effective than things like seawater desalination, which some community, communities are, are considering. Next slide. So in conclusion, um, I want to just highlight, you know, we are facing persistent and new challenges that we must fundamentally change how we use and manage water. Um, we must embrace resilience, including by prioritizing conservation and efficiency to reduce our demand diversifying our supplies, including through reuse and stormwater capture, and then finally shifting toward more integrative management that values green infrastructure and relies on better data and planning. Thank you. Right, so I guess I will uh, jump in here. Bienvenidos a todos. Thank you to Council Member Trujillo. My name is Natalie DeRook. And I am with Tucson Water, uh, representing a department of the city of Tucson. So I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today because we can provide kind of a case study for many of these pieces that uh, Ms. Cooley just shared with, with all of you. Um, you know, we, we find a lot of similarities here in Arizona. So I'll just give you a basic overview of where Tucson is and is situated in the state. Um, I will also say that I love to have more of a conversational style presentation. So I know we will have a QA and a at the end. If any questions come up while I'm speaking, please pop them in the chat and I'll do my best to address them. Um, so Tucson, Arizona is in the Southern part of the state of Arizona and we are quite separate from the Phoenix Metro area. Um, sometimes when you're checking checking out or hearing stories about uh, any of the cities in Arizona in the news media, we're all kind of lumped together. But hydrologically, we're two very separate metro areas. So Phoenix, the Phoenix metro area is roughly about 3 million people. Uh, it's the state capital, and it has its own uh, hydrological profile. It is its own what's called an active management area. So in Arizona, we have five active management areas, and that that is basically um, the policy, uh, the policies that were developed, and the ways that we govern our water resources within the state of Arizona. Now, if you move a little bit further down in Arizona, about an hour away from the U.S.-Mexico border, you have Tucson. And the Tucson metro area is roughly about 1 million people. Um, we have a couple of suburbs and it is its own active management area that sits on top of two aquifers. We have the Avra Valley Aquifer and we have the Tucson Aquifer. And I would say what distinguishes, distinguishes us the most from Phoenix is the fact that Tucson, um, if any of you have driven on I-10 through here, you know that all of our rivers are dry. Right, you see a blue line on the map, but what you get when you drive over them is a massive dry riverbed, meaning that we do not have access to surface water. All of our water in our active management area is stored underground. And this is a huge distinction for us um, because Phoenix, the Phoenix area does have access to surface water and they manage that very differently. But with those, with that concept in mind, we have a very different kind of mindset when it comes to uh, conservation and managing our water resources. So to give you a bit of a breakdown about the demographics in our city, um, our Hispanic population, Hispanic Latino population is about 44.6% compared to the rest of the state that sits at about 31.4%, right? And then down from that, um, we have, you know, uh, uh, it, I'm getting this from the census, right? So, uh, the white population is about 42.6. And then we have a 4.4, uh, black or African American population. And then, um, we also have, uh, American, American Indian or the indigenous peoples here in the desert within the Tucson area that that comes out to about 3.4%. But again, if you've been to Tucson, you know that um, we are surrounded by um, on one side, the Tana Atom Nation, and we also have the Pascuayaki Nation. And our, you know, within Tucson, we have um, pockets of other tribal members and I would like to just stop here and give a land acknowledgement to those tribal members and really um, just 
offer that thanks for uh, being here. Um, so Tucson is also a pretty, I would say it's not a wealthy city. It, the, the median household income for Tucson only sits at about $48,000 a year. And there's about a 20% level of poverty. And again, these numbers are ones that we can record, right? So there's a whole number of people that aren't taken into account for these demographics. And that is something that, that we have to look at. But with that in mind, when we're talking about how Tucson manages, we you know, are faced with an extreme drought, just like the rest of the region. We don't have access to surface water. And what we do is we supplement our groundwater here with water from the Colorado River through the Central Arizona Project, which is an aqueduct that runs from Lake Mead all the way through uh, Arizona and deposits the water here where we are able to um, take that water and infuse that into the ground uh, and that infiltrates into our aquifers and helps us deal with issues of subsidence and all of these other hydrological issues I won't I won't get into now but it's very very interesting when you're looking at a case study for water resource management because we have these different factors that may or may not affect other communities across the country but what's really interesting about this is that Tucson is a city that rallies around water conservation. And we are blessed to have an amazing mayor and council that is incredibly supportive of our water resource management strategies. And it has their finger on the pulse with what is happening within the community, within with their constituents, and really works hand in glove with the water utility to implement um, policies and practices that, that serve the community very well in light of our um, our needs for water resource management, you know, looking into the future. But what I would say is that, um, I don't know if this is a good time, Zayda, maybe to pull up our um, responsible desert dweller guide and I'll kind of talk through this. So backing up a little bit, one thing that we really pride ourselves on in Tucson is a heritage of water conservation. So we know that we have had people inhabiting this area for at least 4,000 years. And through that period of time, um, and through the different waves of people coming into the Tucson area, we've, out of necessity, have uh, established strong, strong water conservation uh, practices, whether that dates back to people using oyas to collect the rainwater. There's a lot of rainwater collection here. Um, or all the way through the turn of the century where people rallied together when our Santa Cruz River did have uh, some flow of water through it, um, the community elected someone called a Zanjero that would help manage the water resources for the community because it was kind of a free for all with the ranches and the agriculture here. Um, so what we've done in terms of water conservation most recently is to launch the Tucson Water Runs Deep campaign. And are we able to pull up that, that link and maybe share it with the group? Yes, it's in the chat. It's in it is in the chat. chat. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So what we have is the Tucson Water Runs Deep campaign. And we found what we found here in Tucson is that not only do we need to implement and work with our mayor and council to uh, implement policies and procedures that work in terms of like development and economic development and all of these modern day pieces that we have to juggle in the desert. But the way that we do that, the way that we found that is incredibly successful is to draw upon the heritage of water conservation here. And that is something that we have, you know, it says right here, a legacy of water stewardship. So what we have here, if we scroll to the top of the page or down, you know, we, we launched this campaign rather recently to take a look at the heritage and the history of water conservation in Tucson. Now, water is the cornerstone of uh, Mayor Regina Romero's uh, climate climate action hub where we have a five point program that is designed to create resiliency 
and inclusion here in the Tucson community to really make sure that we are being responsible stewards of the Sonoran Desert. Water is a huge piece of that. So drawing on these heritage pieces, we take people through this journey um, to look at how they there are basically our ancestors and people who have lived in Tucson before have conserved water. And what that gets into in terms of modern day policy is looking at the extensive amount of rebates and incentives that we offer um, through the utility that support uh, you know, smart water use and through both active and passive uh, systems, right? So when we're looking at new development in the desert, uh, we're taking a look at making sure that all homes are, are fitted um, there was an ordinance passed, all homes are fitted with gray water fixtures. Of course, it's kind of impossible to go to the hardware store and not pick up a toilet or some water fixture that, that isn't EPA water sense. I think they all are now, but all homes are fitted with that. Um, and providing those rebates and incentives, but also making sure that um, in addition to the policy pieces and passing the ordinances, we do our best in the Tucson community to ensure that we have um, community stakeholders and services for people who maybe live in older homes or fall into, uh, uh, they're in a low income home and maybe they need to fix a leaky toilet or, you know, any number of things. We, we like to be sure that we have um, those resources there. Um, in addition to that, one thing that has been incredibly successful for Tucson is our green stormwater infrastructure program. And so that really fits at the utility hand in, hand in hand with our conservation program. And the Green Stormwater Infrastructure Program goes out, um, identifies areas to um, in the community to uh, build passive rainwater harvesting systems so that the water from the street because when it rains here, you'll see people going down the street in canoes <laughs> because the drainage is not so great, but we found a way to passively pull that water in and use that as a resource. And that's very important for us here in the Tucson community. I think I might be kind of getting caught up on time. So I'll, I'll jump over to, um, to a couple of things and I'll try to wrap it up. Most recently when we're looking, those are, those are things that we've done at the local level. Um, at the federal level, you may or may not have seen in the news that our mayor recently signed agreements um, with the Bureau of Reclamation uh, through the Central Arizona Project uh, on compensated system conservation. And what that is, is basically Tucson has been at the forefront for the state of Arizona in voluntarily giving up um, some of its Colorado River allocations. And the reason we're able to do that is because we have been responsible stewards of water and banking water in our aquifer. So that when push came to shove and we're facing issues of drought, we, we take pride in setting the example for Arizona and for the region and saying, we're willing to put so much water on the table. We would like other communities to voluntarily give up this amount of water so that we can really be responsible stewards of the Colorado River. But most recently we entered into an agreement where we um, agreed to give up 110 acre feet, 110,000 acre feet over the next three years um, in exchange for, uh, uh, I think it's $400 an acre foot with the Bureau so that we can make sure that we are continuing to be responsible stewards of the Colorado River. So for 2023, um, we've given up about 50,000 acre feet and followed by 30,000 acre feet over 2024 and 2025. And once we were able to do this, um, you know, we, we won't take full credit for it, but we know that other cities in Arizona were willing to put something on the table to also um, you know, garner support around the Colorado River, make sure that there's value um, in that exchange for everybody, but so that we're preserving that resource. Um, I'm gonna jump over to our One Water 2100 okay. plan, because I think there's a lot of questions about that and it ties mm -hmm. right into what Ms. Cooley had mentioned before. So our One Water 2100 plan is 
our plan, very Tucson specific, thank you, that really focuses on facing diverse water challenges to and to address those water challenges through integrated water resource planning. And so some of you have may have seen the one, one water movement across the country. Um, it's not unique to Tucson, but what we did do is take this plan and really shape it so that it speaks to Tucsonans. And a huge piece of this plan was making sure that we had stakeholder and community engagement. Um, and we did that through scenario planning. So our vision is that through the coming together of our stakeholders, bringing wonderful ideas to the table that we could really ensure long-term resilience, um, really demonstrate equity, especially when it comes to water equity, which is important to us. Um, and water stewardship without compromise, this is really important, without compromising quality of life and without compromising economic development and some of these key pieces that lean towards creating a thriving community. So we are able to do that. For those of you that are new to the One Water concept, um, we bring together four uh, types of water, surface water, recycled water, stormwater and groundwater to create that integrated plan. And right now we are in the middle of a public comment period where we have a draft plan and we're waiting for public comment to be able to finalize that plan. Um, we may get more questions about this yeah. um, in the end, but really pulling a one water plan together for your community is something that I really think can be done in any community and should be done. And it really allows the regular person and people with business and economic development interests to come together and sit at a round table and brainstorm what our water future will look like. So um, we may not have enough time today to address that, but anyone on this call is welcome yeah. to reach out and talk to us about that. Thank you, Director DeRook. We, we're gonna enter into the, the question uh, section of our program. Sure. But right off the bat, uh, you know, I just wanted to ask you directly, you know, the governor of Arizona just uh, made an announcement about uh, the growth of Phoenix and some mm -hmm. restrictions that are happening on there. Have there been any kind of uh, directions towards the Tucson area? I know that you've done a lot of planning. Mm -hmm. Has there been any kind of discussion about your growth and, and, and housing and, mm -hmm. and the future with the governor? So, you know, the, the, the groundwater model that Governor Hobbs uh, uh, took a look at, um, it basically evaluated water level changes looking out for 100 years. And what they found in that particular area, in the Phoenix area, was that those projections were off by about 4%, which required um, the Phoenix metro area to make some changes, the, the Phoenix MA to make some, some changes in how um, development was taking place. And so it's my understanding that that um, those changes, the results uh, with that model prediction don't necessarily mean that any current development will be affected, but any new development that happens in that area that will be associated with a new utility um, would be affected. And as I mentioned in the first part of, of this call, um, Tucson has a very different approach to development and, and ensuring that we have really robust uh, water resources to handle development. So to my knowledge, no, there has not been. Um, it would. It's important to say that because of our responsible water resource management, um, Tucson right now is in a position where we have water banked. Um, we're not, you know, we call it our, our water checkbook. We're not up to the the limit in that checkbook where we're about to be overdrawn, we've managed to really replenish the aquifer in a way that we're able to account for new development and new businesses coming into the area. Great, and then for Ms. Cooley, uh, we, we have some questions here. Uh, what are some options that policymakers have available to them to offset the cost of investing in water infrastructure for the regions and communities? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and you know, there's and there's so many different ways to answer this. So let me let me start. Uh, and and Natalie, you may want to add on to this as well. Um, so I think one of the ways that we can help to sort of reduce the cost is to reduce the need for new infrastructure. Um, and I, I talked a little bit about sort of the opportunities and efficiency in reducing the need for new wastewater and wastewater infrastructure. And and those uh, cost savings can be quite significant. 
Um, and and I'll put a I'll put a link in the chat. We did a study uh, just last year um, that really synthesized a number of studies that have been done for communities. Um, you know, in Los, I'll use the Los Angeles example. I'll provide an Arizona one as well. But in Los Angeles, what they found is between 1990 and 2016, because of their efficiency improvements, they avoided 11 billion dollars investments in wa water infrastructure, and that was just on the water side. They had estimated similar savings on the wastewater side as well. So that's a significant amount of cost savings. Again, that's passed on. Um, there, uh, Gilbert, Arizona is another town that's that's been growing really rapidly. Um, they'd estimated, you know, over a twenty, over an eighteen-year period, they had avoided about three hundred and forty million in capital costs um, and nearly four million in an, annual operating costs. So. Really, you know, these opportunities to advance efficiency really do translate into cost savings and, and affordability. I think, though, too, another way to kind of look at this uh, is to look at opportunities for uh, state, depending on what state you're in, or federal funding to help communities offset some of the costs for the investments that they do need to make. And I think we're, you know, there were there was a significant amount of money uh, dedicated towards water infrastructure investments. Obviously, that came out of the Biden administration, um, and so those programs are just starting to roll out. Uh, and I think there's, you know, and and I think uh, rightfully there is more of an equity focus uh, on these funds, trying to make them more available uh, to to communities that need them the most and ha often have not been able to benefit from them. Uh, there's still challenges there, but I do think there's that intent. So, um, I, you know, I think there's a lot more opportunities for doing that. I think there's broader recognition of the need um, as well. And again, Natalie, if you want to add to that, I'm sure you have you have a lot to add from your experiences too. Yeah, I think that sums it up pretty well. And, um, you know, in the Arizona context, along with, you know, the newly released model by Governor Hobbs, uh, Governor Hobbs also announced a $40 million investment from the American Rescue uh plan act that would support these pieces, uh, especially when it comes to water uh, conservation and, you know, critical infrastructure needs. So uh, there are opportunities that are, I would say, become more available. But yes, I would agree. I would agree with Ms. Mr. Mr. Rook, you, you touched a little bit on this question. It says, what are some of the uh, best practices counties and cities can adopt in our city buildings, schools, and businesses to use water more wisely and prepare for more frequent and per persistent periods of limited water supply. You mentioned gray water. Are there other opportunities that we have to kind of build our infrastructure in a certain way to use less water? Yeah, I mean, I think what we see here in Tucson is just that people make a concerted effort in their day-to-day -day behavioral practices. So while there are policies that can be put into place, and I think Ms. Cooley, you know, talked a bit about um, some of the technological advances, which are phenomenal, make a big difference. Um, here in Tucson, we we look at behavioral change and, and how we use water and reuse water. It, it, it really is, uh, for us, uh, quite simple in a lot of ways, yeah. And how can we start a one water plan? Um, how can cities and local government kind of take that approach? Yeah, well, the, you know, the one water movement, uh, we work closely with the U.S. Water Alliance. And for anybody who is not uh, familiar with the U.S. Water Alliance on this call, I would really encourage you to take a look at their website. They do a phenomenal job at looking at equitable practices um, in, in the water world, but also translating those, um, those pieces, those practices and those policies so that the average person can feel really engaged in that conversation about water, which I think is what a lot of people are craving right now. So they have some wonderful uh, templates there. You are also very welcome to take a look at the city of Tucson's One Water Plan. Um, we really approached it as a grassroots endeavor um, and, and approached it as an opportunity to open up conversation and develop relationships with the community, the diverse community and diverse stakeholders. And Council Member Trujillo, if I, I could just add one thing on that too. I, you know, I do think um, one of the challenges with water is this, uh, is the sort of fragmentation, the silos that I had mentioned. Uh, and, 
And for some communities, it's it's the municipality, the city that's providing water. But but for 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 others, it's not. Uh, there's a separate entity providing water and and maybe even wastewater and stormwater. And so, you know, I do think that cities uh, and city councils have an opportunity in those instances to sort of bring these different partners together um, and, and may be able to provide more of a platform for that partnership and engagement because the one water. Um, movement is a really important one, but it does, it is predicated on collaboration. And, and, and what, what type of partners do you foresee kind of local government working with? Yeah, I mean, I think at a, at a minimum, it's, it's the water and wastewater and stormwater sort of managers. But I, you know, as I think Natalie rightfully points out that these need to be sort of community kind of driven types of plan. Those are the best plans anyway, uh, that are community driven um, because the values and the priorities and the choices will, will vary. And so I do think community leaders can play a really important role in sort of facilitating that process and bringing that to the fore. Absolutely. Great. And then uh, one more question I have here is just an overall, I know, Ms. Cooley, you, you've been kind of working at a, a overall perspective. How do you generally feel communities of color and vulnerable communities are affected by these water issues? Yeah, great question. Um, and, and I think, you know, I know that there's a lot of evidence that indicates that communities color of color and low income suffer the greatest impacts from a lot of these uh, uh, extremes that, that we've talked about. Uh, if you look at floods, if you look at droughts, um, there's, there's evidence, unfortunately, on a, on a daily basis of that. Um, and, and there are lots, you know, I, some of that is, is a nature of being exposed to it, uh, people living in low-lying areas, infrastructure is not sort of adequate or, or uh, updated. Um, and, and when we think about sort of recovery opportunities, um, folks may be underinsured or uninsured. Uh, and so when they are impacted by a disaster, uh, the, the recovery, the road to recovery can be much, much longer and, and more challenging. Um, the, the other thing, Thing, thing I'll just add too, you know, if you think about drought specifically, um, it's it's you know, and, and it's farm worker communities that are often impacted because of following, for example, or fishing communities um, because you know we've seen with salmon salmon numbers are down, and so um, you know the impacts unfortunately are are quite broad um, and affect a lot of people uh, unfortunately, um, and so I do think. Again, there's been greater acknowledgement and awareness about that for more broadly. I think that's a first step, but we need to be crafting policies and programs to support these communities um, so that they are able to recover uh, and that they are they don't experience the impacts uh, in the first place. And, and if I could add on to that, one thing that is incredibly important on the ground is just being able to assure, ensure affordability and really assessing what that affordability is and what some of those barriers on the ground are to accessing, um, well, ex there's accessibility, but also accessing uh, water and making sure that people have, have equal access to this resource. Um, one thing that has been incredibly important for the city of Tucson and for Tucson Water is to ensure that some of um, you know, again, more on the ground, more uh, community oriented, but ensuring that people feel that they can be a part of the conversation. Um, if we're dealing with, uh, you know, portions of the community that are really impacted by poverty or other factors, make, making sure that we understand what methods of communication are effective and available and, and easy to access for people. Um, you know, for us, it really comes down to behavioral change and accessibility for some of these smaller pieces on the day to day. Ms. Cooley, can you give us your 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 thoughts to inspire us on our on our trip down this uh, this path to water conservation in our communities? Yeah. So, um, you know, first, I, I just I see so many opportunities. I see a lot of progress that has been made. Um, over the past several decades, but we still have many opportunities and, and we'll need to do better. Um, and and I, I think, you know, this, this group is a really important one um, to be understanding sort of some of the complexities of these issues, but also the opportunities for solutions. So, you know, I, I, I know that there are solutions out there. And so, you know, having folks 
um, it, elected officials in particular that are able to, to sort of understand and drive some of these solutions, I think it's going to be critical to really realizing the, the opportunities and the potential that, that, are, that our research has shown that are possible. Ms. Daruk, would you like yeah. to give us a couple words on water resiliency in your community and how we can bring our communities to the point of planning? Yes. First and foremost, get your young people engaged. There's a huge disparity between people who are having the conversation and people who seem to not be involved in that conversation. And what we see here is there's a big difference between the way young people engage and the way people, you know, a little bit, a little bit older engage. So get the young people excited in the conversation about water. Uh, you know, go out every day, demonstrate make an example of, of behavioral change that's easy and accessible and doesn't cost anything. And just try to pull those pieces together, um, demonstrate how the question about water and water issues and water resilience is inherently tied to so many of those social issues or climate related issues that we see today. It all starts with the community. Great, any last remaining questions from audience? Great. And again, I, there we go. Yeah, Councilman, I just wanted to highlight yeah. there is a comment that was um, put in the chat uh, during Miss um, Cooley's presentation that I wanted to read and see if um, you had any thoughts, Miss Cooley. Uh, the comment uh, was, I recently attended a far west Texas water planning meeting, and they showed similar results in less water usage. However, more demand, population growth, we're still in a drought and agriculture is hit hard. Yes, yeah, I, I mean, I think that speaks to um, the challenges. I mean, we've seen some of the, some progress, but that hasn't, but, but we're still seeing those pressures on resources intensifying. Um, and some of that has to do with, you know, the fact that supply has become more variable, um, that the West is becoming hotter and drier. Uh, and that's putting pressure uh, on that. And then, and then too, with population growth, again, while we've shown and demonstrated that communities are able to grow without adding use, um, that didn't come by accident. <laughs> um, that took a lot of work. It took a lot of intention. Uh, and, and so, you know, there's, there's, there's a significant amount of, of need to kind of continue to, to push, uh, push for that um, so that we can, we can address the challenges that we're all facing. Thank you. Um, and I, I know in my community in Rialto, um, planning has always been part of our, uh, our community. We have a flood control uh, district that has uh, bait water catch basins for the 100 year flood. Um, and part of the, the, the partnership is creating a recharging basin in each of them so that every time we have kind of this fast water that comes with us, and even for the future, that we're able to capture that and bank it into our groundwater system. Uh, some of the other kind of projects that uh, maybe some other cities in our area have been looking to is um, a lot of our water treatment plants um, are placing a lot of fluent water into the Santa Ana River. We're seeing a lot of them taking out the part of the fluent water and, and using it for irrigation. Our, um, we have a partnership with the city of Fontana and the Inland Empire Utility Agency in our region uh, to, to use that fluent water to be the gray water to be able to um, uh, use that for landscaping. And there's a lot of opportunities um, in California now with water planning. Uh, the city of Rialto is in the first cohort for a Grow Water Smart uh, program. It is a program with the Water Education for Latino Leaders, uh, WELL, and partnership with the Sonora Institute. And so they're having these cohorts of, of grant funded programs where city staff sit together and collaborate on how to uh, bring in uh, water in, in, in terms of planning the growth for the cities. So uh, the first cohort is this uh, summer that my city's participating in, in California, uh, but there's supposed to be another one in December. If you want more information on how to get your community involved, feel free to reach out to, uh, to the WELL program. It's latinosforwater.org and they'll be able to give you more information on how your city can participate in one of these cohorts and be able to plan uh, ahead 
uh, for water use, uh, for the future of, of your community's growth, water resilience as we talk about. It. But thank you so much. It's, it's been a pleasure to be here with you. And I uh, want to thank one more time our, our speakers, Ms. Heather Cooley and Ms. Natalie Daruk, for their contributions in, in, in this discussion. And I, I believe we all kind of are taking back a lot of information to our communities with a lot of inspiration uh, to be able to kind of get involved in these discussions on water. I, I know it's a challenge for many uh, Latino leaders and elected officials to have a, a part of that conversation, uh, depending on uh, how you're involved. But I'm, I'm glad that this discussion is taking place because really this conversation should have everybody at the table all leaders at the table, uh, because uh, planning provides so many opportunities for our communities for the future. Thank you, Councilman. Um, and because I don't wanna leave any uh, questions on the table, and I think that this okay. is a good one. Um, someone um, asked uh, for um, Ms. Daruk, how does the city of Tucson bank its water? Ah, this is great. I love talking about this. So as I mentioned, we have, uh, no surface water. We only have our aquifers here in the Tucson Active Management Region. Um, we do a couple of things. Um, the first is our water comes in through the uh, massive aqueduct, the Central Arizona Project, and we bring that into an area in the Tucson Basin that used to be agricultural area. Um, it, it over time was not used for agriculture anymore, but we do uh, bring that water in where it infiltrates through basins down into the aquifer. And uh, that's what we do. Um, we do that. We have several, I want to say here uh, that we have several uh, basins around the city for sometimes for recycled water. Um, but one thing that's really important in the Tucson community, because we don't have a lot of lakes um, or a lot of a lot of you know water amenities is that we've managed to make some of these uh, infiltration basins into like parks and water amenities for the community, which is really quite incredible here. So um, that is how we you know recharge our aquifer. Is there a part of the question that I, I maybe forgot to answer? There's. It doesn't seem like it. Okay. Um, Councilman Trujillo, thank you so much for joining us and to sure. Ms. Cooley and Mr. Rock for sharing your expertise, for um, sharing how uh, the city of Tucson is um, uh, engaging and continue to engage in conservation efforts. And uh, again, a special thank you to uh, the Water Education for Latino Leaders as well. Um, and to uh, their team and their executive director, Mr. Paul Hernandez, who is joining us here. And you um, look them up. They have um, uh, some fellowship programs that you can engage with. And we will send everyone a follow-up email with some of the, with the links that were shared uh, in the presentation, as well as the link to this recording if you wish to um, go back and view it again, or if you want to um, share it with your colleagues that could not join us, um, you can do that. And um, we look forward to um, continuing this conversation. Uh, as it's, a, it's a critical um, and timely one to, to have. So thank you, everyone. I hope you have a good rest of your day and week.